folks want to be free from sea to shining sea. Oops, I guess I just called for the elimination of the United States of America. I have not. I've called for the prevalence of justice, respect, and humanity across the entire land. And that's what that phrase really means. From the river to the sea is calling for the presence of justice, wholeness, and humanity. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, a member of ICAD USA, and uh, also uh, the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, both co-sponsors of today's interview. During these dire days, we're grateful to spend a little time with our friend, Reverend Graylin Hagler. For over five decades, Graylin's been on the front lines in Chicago, Boston, Washington, D.C., working for political, economic, and racial justice. He's protested injustices against Blacks, uh, Palestinians, Latinos, confronted corporations on hiring practices, challenged local governments, and been an outspoken critic of military tactics used by police. He's marched, organized, and been arrested. And as I said, he's been a tireless partner in the struggle for full Palestinian political and human rights. Graylin, uh, welcome. Uh, and before we get started, I, I wanted to jump right into Gaza, as I mentioned to you. But uh, as soon as you start speaking, people will notice that you sound hoarse. But in our conversation a few minutes ago, you shared with me about uh, a health concern. And so would you take a minute to share that with your friends here on the call? Well, thank you so much, Michael. It's good to be here with everyone. Um, and what Michael's referring to is that about three years ago, I was diagnosed with cancer in the throat and uh, went through chemotherapy and radiation. And uh, the radiation proceeded in destroying one of my vocal cords. So one of my vocal cords is paralyzed. The cancer came back in March. I was told that unless they remove my voice box in eight to 12 months, I would be dead. And uh, I didn't allow them to, to remove my voice box and um, instead opting to go into immunotherapy. And here I am today with the cancer in remission, uh, still feeling uh, the the uh, the lack of volume to my voice from a paralyzed vocal cord, but the cancer is in remission, and I'm feeling stronger than ever, and doing the work that I'm called to do, and I just give thanks to God for all of that, and thank you for your prayers and thoughts. Well, um, as I mentioned to you before, Graylin, we love you, and here in Fort Wayne, and I know the people on the call today either already do or once they hear from you will uh, love you and love what you do and what you stand for. And so we're so appreciative that uh, you are joining us today. Well, we're, uh, we're almost two months into Israel's assault, this brutal genocidal assault on Gaza. We've titled this webinar, Black Lives Matter, Palestinian Lives Matter. Tell us, uh, if you would, given the lived out Black experience in the United States, why so many Black and other people of color, color both understand and support uh, the people of Palestine and the people of Gaza during these days? Well, I think that people of color, particularly Black folks, come and they look at what's being reported with a special kind of cynicism. And it's important to have that cynicism because they look at the one-sided reporting of corporate media and basically hear that it's bias 
It's one-sided. I remember when I was growing up in Baltimore, they would refer to crimes in the paper, in the newspaper, that whites committed, and they would call them toughs. And if blacks committed it, they were called hoodlums. So it was the use of the words that were intentionally used to transmit ideas around race and to also transmit concepts to dehumanize people. And that's what we've been dealing with in terms of Gaza, in terms of the Palestinian struggle, issues that we face all the time is that there has been a Zionist construct that has been put forth in the media and put forth in the US politics and to some degree in European politics that weighs with favoritism on this and totally ignores the kind of oppression and pain that Palestinians have been feeling. Think about Gaza. The report in such a way as if what took place on October the 7th came out of a vacuum is to totally ignore 75 years and more of history. And that's a sin to ignore this pervasive and prevalent system of racism and of dehumanization and to act that somehow this came out of a vacuum, was unprovoked, and therefore was really horrendous. I want to follow that. Thank you, Graylin. I want to follow up with that. You know, li liberation struggles everywhere uh, uh, get this. They, they find common cause with Palestine. Uh, Black Lives Matter, Red Nation, Cairo, South Africa with Kairos Palestine in the last week, sent out an open letter to people around the world. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, noted in his letter from a Birmingham jail, freedom is never given voluntarily by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Liberation struggles around the world get this. All the time. I mean, one of the things is that if you, if you recollect, I had to correct Reverend William Barber on some statements that he had made in, in reaction to what took place uh, on October 7th, uh, on, in October. And one of the things I was saying, he was saying that out of the oppression that black folks felt, they never responded with violence. Well, what do you call the Nat Turner uprising? What do you call the Stono rebellion? What do you call what Denmark Vesey was planning in South Carolina and the over 300 documented cases of enslaved uprising? Because what happens is violence is always the voice of those who have been silenced and those who have been ignored. And that's the problem. If we want peace and justice, we got to stop ignoring peace and justice when it's inconvenient for us you know you talked about <clears throat> you talked about the context Braylon, uh and, and of course this uh, was not an unprovoked uh, although you know the corporate owned media israel and their hacks in congress and in the biden administration comment on this for me uh these young palestinian fighters who entered israel and killed israelis on october 7th I'm thinking of them growing up, you know, in 2005, right? Supposedly Israel kind of left Gaza as the narrative. Well, these the, the babies who were born in 2005 were 18 in 2023. They grew up under this occupation, under a brutal Israeli uh, blockade, rationing calories, poisoning fields, water supplies, shooting unarmed nonviolent protesters, the daily humiliations, they grew up under that oppressive kind of conditions and how they were created, in a sense, by the occupation. Say a word about that kind of context in Gaza. Well, it's the thing is that if you've been brutalized and your family has been brutalized, 
You have an anger that's within you, a frustration, a pain that has not been addressed by the world out there. Uh, when you think about it, think about what does it mean to have your family wiped out or half your family wiped out or your parents wiped out. I'm dealing with a friend right now, Christian friend who is from Gaza and all of her family are held up in that historical church in Gaza right now. And all of their homes have been destroyed. The woman that babysat her went home to get some blankets and was gunned down in the street by IDF, even though she was in her 70s and left to bleed in the street, bleed to death. What kind of impact does that have? Even when we talk about the tunnels that are there and Israel and the IDF love to talk about those tunnels. Yeah. Those tunnels were built by Israel in 2005. That's why they know that they're there. It was built by Israel because they were afraid of the populace in Gaza. And as they occupied it, they needed to do stuff underground to move supplies and equipment. They built the tunnels. That's how they know what's there. They built a tunnel under the hospital. So it is not, you know, so the fact is, is that we don't even hear the entire story. But can you imagine what does it feel like to suffer that painful loss in your immediate and extended family and no one else in the world seems to care? You know, our mutual friend Mark Braverman uh, just pointed out uh, in the chat that Ilan Pape recently made the point that the Hamas fighters who entered those kibbutzim were the third generation descendants of people who had been driven out f from those destroyed from the destroyed villages upon which those same kibbutzim were built. Um, uh, so this this sort of generational trauma. Um, uh, uh, it just perpetuates itself. Thank you, Mark, for that. Yeah, it's good to hear from Mark. Let me, uh, you mentioned your comments to, about William Barber. I had that in my uh, notes here. Um, you want to say, you want to say another word about that, uh, that open letter that you wrote to William Barber and what was the reaction that you got? And have you heard, I know that you go way back with William Barber and I believe even his dad. Yes. Uh, uh, do you want to say a word about uh, what you heard back uh, from him or, or any reaction to the uh, open letter you sent through Mondo White? Well, yeah, I did not expect to hear back from him, but I um, heard from a lot of the folks around him who largely supported what I had to say in that response. Because I had to ask the question, and I asked the question in every group, if you're going to cry on October the 7th, where were your tears on October 6th, October 5th, last year and last decade, when what has been going on against Palestinians was taking place? We can't cry in this moment and have neglected our tears and pains over what has been happening to Palestinians for the last seven and a half decades. You know, the fact is, we are basically operating in a place of political expediency to cry now and to not have cried last year or last decade. This has been going on and our silence is the reason that it's been going on. And that's what I was trying to convey to Barbara. Well, it was a, a prophetic word and a necessary word, and you were the one to speak it, to be honest with you. And we're, we were delighted uh, that you spoke it, and you spoke it on the behalf of many of us on this call and many of us uh, around the country. You brought up the role of the corporate-owned media, Graylin, and I've been saying that here, uh, I'm not the only one, of course, that this isn't just a war on, on uh, um, uh, uh, Hamas. 
this is a war on truth. I mean, you think about the number of, of Palestinian journalists that have been killed. I mean, Shireen Abu Akleh, of course, you know, it's been over a year now, but she, she's she been sort of the poster child, right, for the, the target, as a Palestinian American, of, of all things. So she she became kind of the face, but really, since yeah. October the since October the seventh, uh, what over forty, uh, uh, and I'm sure many more than that have been targeted and killed, uh, and and press buildings in Gaza had been bombed, et cetera, et cetera, and that's not to mention the foreign journalists who've been targeted and killed. Say a word about this war on truth and the role of the media, the role of the press. Yeah, the numbers almost reaching fifty at this point that we know of that have been killed. But it's also an attempt to conquer and to stamp down any type of criticism of the dominant narrative that exists. And it's basically putting in motion the kind of suppression of political criticism and the questioning of political ideology. Basically, to make sure that media conforms to a machine of propaganda and that voices who have an alternative view in a sense will be silenced and only those voices that basically promulgate the collective narrative out there will be the only voices that will be out there and be deemed legitimate so it's a war of truth and it's a war in terms of our ability to question the fascism that is going on around us. We got to have the ability to question it. They are clear that they will kill the vehicles that do not conform to the status quo ideology. We interviewed Diana Butu uh, uh, a week or two ago, and she called uh, the corporate owned Western media stenographers for the Israeli government. And there's a reason for that, you know, because the, they're not objective uh, uh, journalists, even if there was ever such a thing. That when you call them corporate-owned media, that tells you everything that you need to know. And also the issue, Michael, just look at it. If you looked at CNN, if you looked at MSNBC, Fox News, how are you going to report on Gaza from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv? How are you going to have an objective reporting by embedding yourself with the idea of forces, with Israeli forces? In other words, it is clearly subjective and it's clearly biased. And that's why we struggle to get out the truth. And we've been struggling with getting that truth out for years. But I think that they may have overstepped their bounds and that more people are aware, more people are critical, more people are raising questions. When you look at the not in my name, which are young Jews yeah. that are out on the line, when you look at Jewish Voice for Peace, that are older Jews that are out on the line, all questioning this idea of Zionism and questioning whether occupation is legitimate and questioning whether there needs to be a evaluation and a reevaluation of what we've been doing and what we need to do. I want to I want to follow up on that uh, again. You know uh, what I've been saying here um, in our demonstrations on Tuesdays that no matter what the TV news, you know, the chyrons come across the bottom of the page, a war on Hamas. But it, it's not only a war on Hamas, a war on truth, but it, it's a war on Gaza. And it's not just a war on Gaza. It's a war on the Palestinian people. It's a war on Palestinian history and culture, a war on the very idea of Palestine itself. And it's an erasing, it's an attempt to erase Palestine from human consciousness. I'm thinking of Tibet, but I'm also thinking, because I've had workings with Tibetan folks uh, back uh, uh, when I was a younger 
pastor in St. Louis, but other other indigenous peoples, uh, uh, Native Americans, black and brown folks, and others talk about the erasure of a of a culture of a people uh, from your perspective. Well, I think that one of the things that we forget is that the whole ideology of Zionism comes out of Europe. And therefore, it's rooted in that European paradigm of conquest, imperialism, and settler colonialism. In this case, it becomes, in a sense, Jewish, but it's really not Jewish, because there are other people who are Jews other than Ashkenazi, right? People exist in other places. But this is a European paradigm that was created with the aid and assistance of European forces. Those European forces that assented to this European Zionism were in a sense operating out of their own anti-Semitism. They wanted to answer the Jewish question without Jews settling in the UK and in France. So they said, give them Palestine. As if Europeans had the right to dispose of a land to another people. You know, that's a part of the paradigm that we're dealing with. But it's also the struggle of indigenous people all over the world that culture has been displaced and been destroyed, particularly in this common era by this European ideology. Think about the Berlin Conference when Leopold and others spread out a map in Berlin on the continent of Africa and said, the Netherlands can have this, we'll have this as Belgium, the French can take this, the United Kingdom can have that, as if they had a right to divide up Africa. It's the same model, the same kind of settler colonialism that creates disruption in the world and destroys indigenous culture and populations. You know, I just uh, led a tour with one of Desmond Tutu's dear friends, uh, uh, Reverend Edwin Arison in the footsteps of Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And we led this tour through South Africa for a couple of weeks and we're doing it again in May. And it and we, we met with Alan Bosak and, and others uh, who, are, uh, uh, who, who are integrally involved, not only in the South Africa anti-apartheid struggle, but now who have spoken out about apartheid in, uh, uh, in Palestine. It came up again and again and again. Let me, uh, I want your reactions. I mean, this, this is just reinforcing what you just said, but it adds another piece to the, to the work you're doing. Um, I've been quoting Native American activist Winona LaDuke, who says, quote, white America can't deal with Gaza because we can't talk about Israel. Europe solved their Jewish problem by exporting the radical terrorist extremist Zionists and their mad plan to Palestine. It's because we can't talk about wounded knee or Canada's boarding schools or forced sterilizations or Andrew Jackson on our $20 bill because we're one huge settlement here on stolen land. We can't talk about Israel here because we are Israel. That's what I'm saying. I mean, that's a part of the, the whole conversation, really. There's a racism. There's an underlying racism in settler colonial regimes, right? Whether it's uh, South it. Africa or Zionism or in this country or wherever you find it, right? Some of the pro-Zionist argument has been, well, we live in America and we took the land from the, from the native population. So should we give it back to them? No. That's what the argument is, because they can't deal with the fact that you're on stolen land. And part of being on stolen land and coming to the realization of your blemished past is determining 
what justice looks like. As Walter Brueggemann says, justice is determining what belongs to whom and returning it. And therefore, unless we can really come to some conclusion around that, around reparations, around this fear of facing our past, we're never gonna resolve these issues. This is why DeSantis and all these folks don't wanna deal with the history of America in the classroom. Yeah. They want to have a false narrative constructed and maintained. A narrative that speaks about exceptionalism and somehow speaks about the goodness of your cause without any blemish and without any fault. And we know that's a lie. But if you buy into that lie, then you can continue to go forth and carry out injustices and oppressions against other people. Well, you know, as I've been doing these interviews, every question really comes back to the role of the the role of the media and and, and truth telling, right? Uh, truth telling by the media, truth telling by politicians, truth telling in, in churches and in mosques and in other places of worship. Just think about Yesh Dean, Betselem, Human Rights Watch, Am Amnesty International, and others have finally, finally, after all these years, named Israel's regime an apartheid regime. We used to call it a conflict, then an occupation, then apartheid. Now, finally, ethnic cleansing and genocide, part of a settler colonial regime. Language, the words we choose to use, language is important and it's necessary if we're going to tell the truth and if change is going to happen yeah and i think i want i want folks to hear me <laughs> closely on this is that corporate media is dominated by zionist ideology that's separate from jewish somehow they've succeeded in conflating Zionism with Judaism or Israel with Judaism. Those are distinct realities. You know, it is not the Jewish domination of the press, but it is the Zionist influence on the press. Just like in America, we can talk about the right wing influence on some press and the left-wing influence on other press. We can talk about that very clearly, very logically. We want, but you know, but the rhetoric has been used that if you suggest something like that, that somehow there is the Zionist agenda that has been carried out in the press because in a sense, it's really synonymous with American manifest destiny and synonymous with the ideology of European settler colonialism. You know, the fact is, is that we need to call it out and name it for what it is, that there is this collusion in terms of ideology. But Zionism is not Juda Judaism. And Israel is not Judaism. Those are distinct and separate realities. You know, we, we're we distrustful, rightly so, whenever religion and nationalism get married. So we call out ISIS, right, and the Taliban. Uh, we, we, we call, we, we know what, we know what, what happens when Christianity and nationalism get married in our country. You know, the attacks on women's health, for example, and LGBTQ folks and refugees and people of color, et cetera. We're distrustful, rightly so, and we condemn whenever religion and nationalism get married. Why do we give Zionism a pass? Well, I don't know if we give it a pass. I think that it becomes part of the whole model that's out there. I mean, just think, 
in American press, the, evan- the white evangelicals are seen as somehow the characteristics of Christianity in America. Very seldom are the progressive Christian voices. Very seldom are they seen and understood as being legitimate Christianity. So you have white Christian evangelism that is dogmatic, that is racist, that is homophobic, that is sexist, xenophobic, you go right on down the line. That's in relationship with Zionism. And they promise that they are to be purveyors of making sure that the land of Israel is secured for Jews because then Christ will return. And then the most perverted theology of all is that when Christ returns, Jews must convert to Christianity or go into eternal hell. So you talk about an anti-Semitic theology, it's there, but right now, the political benefits of white evangelical Christianity and Zionism are complementary to each other. You were talking, B, uh, you and I were talking before um, we got on to the interview today that you're doing some writing now about anti-Semitism. You want to say a word about uh, your thesis in your writing and when we're going to be able to see it? Yeah, it's, 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 it's become interesting to me that people like the head of the ADL has turned their attention and their ire against groups like Jewish's Voices for Peace and Not In My Name and Students for Justice in Palestine and CARE and have turned their attention away from the Nazi party, from all of these white supremacist groups that have historically been anti-Semitic in their program and their agenda. And in that, head of the ADL is trying to clamp down on political discussion by naming just about anything and everything that seems to question the Zionist paradigm as being anti-Semitic and therefore basically bully people and in, in discussion into silence. And when anti-Semitism is everywhere, then it ends up being nowhere. That somehow the Anti-Defamation League and other of those status quo Jewish organizations is lessening the charge and the seriousness of anti-Semitism by making it apply to everything that they don't like, everything that questions their political agenda and their ideology. So I'm basically attempting to argue that when anti-Semitism is everywhere, then it's nowhere at all. Much has been made about the Palestinian chant, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, being anti-Semitic. Yet this has been Israel's 75-year agenda. It's ongoing Nakba of ethnic cleansing, which we're seeing being played out today, not only in the mass transfer of Gaza's population, but also it's happening in the West Bank. I mean, Bibi Netanyahu holds up before the United Nations a map of the geography of the land, and it's all Israel, and people applaud. Um, Talk about that. Well, let me put it this way. Black folks want to be free from sea to shine and see. <laughs> Oops, I guess I just called for the elimination of the United States of America. I have not. I've called for the prevalence of justice, respect, and humanity. 
across the entire land. And that's what that phrase really means. From the river to the sea is calling for the presence of justice, wholeness, and humanity. Free Palestinian life and every Israeli life. So it's calling for justice and righteousness. It's not calling for the destruction. But that points out what the agenda of Netanyahu and all of his cohorts are. They feel that if justice is going to be afforded for Palestinians, then Israel will no longer exist. If a place is made for the sovereignty of Palestinians, then Israel can't exist, which only says that in their mentality, in the mentality of this Zionism, nobody else is allowed to exist on the same land. So they mean that from the river to the sea, they'll wipe out Palestinian dignity. Well, uh, as you can see from some of the chat here, uh, Graylin, that kind of answer provides a lot of resource and help to many of us who are trying to answer that kind of uh, that kind of charge. So we appreciate that. Our friend Pauline Kaufman from Chicagoland uh, talks about uh, how she's more and more convinced that the doctrine of discovery applies to Israel, too, um, and that uh, it's integrally connected, right, with this insidious Christian Zionism that's been inflicting the, the Western church in particular. Do you want to say a little bit more about the doctrine of discovery, its, its racist underpinnings, and Christian Zionism? Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it continues to be a part of, I would put it this way, part of the global north's, and particularly the European global north mentality, that you discovered it, that nobody else was there doing anything productive with it, that you came in and you brought in civilization, and you brought in the kinds of structures that create a civilized society. It's the mentality that people would have starved to death if it was not for you discovering them. People went into Africa feeling that there was no civilization, no culture, no history, and no resources. Same thing as coming into North America and South America, Central America, and the Caribbean, that there was no one here until Europeans showed up and brought civilization and humanized. I remember when I was in seminary in Chicago, I didn't like going to chapel service, but I went one day out of compromise. <laughs> and I, to my surprise, this was during the anti-apartheid struggle. It was being led by white <laughs> South Africans. And the call to worship was, we came to a land wow. and we caused it to blossom and to grow for the water to flow, for God to grow and a land of milk and honey. I shall never forget that. That's the mentality that folks come with in terms of this discovery, doc doctrine of discovery, in terms of this kind of settler um, to civilize. I was talking to a group of black preachers this morning and last night who talked about this relationship between what we refer to as gentrification here and settler colonialism over there is that people move in and take over the neighborhood. And just as Netanyahu said to the world, he needs support because he's living in a bad neighborhood. That's gentrification here. And that's settler, settler colonialism over there. Is you're living in a dangerous neighborhood that you're called to subdue and to subjugate.
you know, uh, uh, we keep hearing from Israel and their acolytes in the U.S. government that they're hell-bent on destroying Hamas. But Hamas could dis disappear tomorrow, right? But the idea of resistance uh, will remain strong. The, uh, resistance doesn't die, right? Uh, uh, you, you can't destroy Palestinian samud, Palestinian resilience, Palestinian resistance. The, the resistance to this ethnic cleansing regime will remain strong. So destroying Hamas doesn't destroy Palestinian resistance. I mean, the fact is, all of this bombing and killing, all of these deaths will create a thousand Hamases. You know, the fact is, is you can't get to peace by trying to bomb your way to peace. You can't get to peace by extracting revenge and collective punishment upon a population. All you do is ferment the anger and the call to resistance. So you'll never ever get there through these means. And then the talk about putting in place a government after Hamas that is obviously palatable to Israel is not to have a government at all. It doesn't bring peace, doesn't bring legitimacy. We tried to do that in Iraq and we tried to do it in Afghanistan. All that time, all that money, all those deaths for nothing because you can't do it. And it would seem that people would learn from history, but unfortunately, people seem dumb and stupid because they don't understand or look at history. Graylin, you're um, in the belly of the beast in Washington, D.C. Um, I, I had always written off Congress as occupied territory, you know, and and the administration, both, both is bipartisan, right, in their uh, support of Israel. And while there's still a lot of pushback, I mean, Biden giving Bibi a, a green light for Israel's genocide in Gaza, Rashida Tlaib being censured recently. While there's a lot of pushback, there, there are signs of some hope, aren't there, uh, uh, among like Cori Bush, uh, Betty McCollum. Uh, Rashida Tlaib, Indiana's own Andre Carson, and others talk about what's happening in D.C. and these what I call small but important signs of hope. Well, I think that one of the things is is that when you had the uh, pro-Israel march and rally, even though it received a lot of press, you had equal if not greater numbers from Palestinians the week before that were in the street here in Washington, D.C. You've had all kinds of resistance that has kept the issues around Gaza and a ceasefire in the face of these politicians. I think they're slowly but certainly hearing the voices, the concern, the issue that not this time Will folks go down easy? Not this time. Will folks be easily silenced? We're continuing to resist, and there are signs of hope. And there's signs of a break in this armor that has existed over these many years that would not question Israel or question what Israel was doing to Palestinians. Do you have any insight into Biden, President Biden's absolutist support of Israel for, I mean, for his entire career, right? On the one hand, on the one hand, during the uh, uh, the BDS conversations uh, about South Africa, Reagan, Helmut Kohl, Margaret Thatcher, all were against boycott, divestment, and sanctions of South Africa. 
one of the voice strong supporters uh strongest supporters of boycott in the senate was joe biden and in fact reagan's veto got overturned uh, uh by the senate because of biden's you know one of his parts of uh, uh leadership so tell me a little bit about uh tell me about biden's turn when it comes to israel why is such a support of israel well, I think that's a part of the old political paradigm. And Biden is a part of that old political paradigm who has a jerk knee reaction that everything that Israel does, it has to be supported because there's a strong lobby here and in the country that exists that will run him out of office if he did not agree with supporting Israel. What he's missed, and what a lot of people have missed, is the demographic shifts in the country. That you have pockets of Palestinians and Africans and people of Arab descent that form a serious voting block in this country, particularly in battleground states. You know, it's just like when the sister was sanctioned from, from uh, Detroit, Michigan. Yeah. She stood up and she said something on the floor. She said that she was from a beautiful place with a black population, and that black population taught her to stand up and speak truth to power. There's that relationship that has come into being between Palestinians and the black community as we teach each other and we feed off of each other's struggle and define that struggle in some new ways. It's not the old paradigm, it's something that's new. You've worked with Jewish individuals and Jewish organizations uh, that have stood with uh, Black Lives Matter uh, and groups like, so you mentioned JVP. I mean, Jewish Voice for Peace being banned at Columbia, it blows my mind, but, uh, ICAD, if not now, not in our name, et cetera. Talk about why Jewish support, especially in our country, is so important for Palestinian rights. Well, it's important yeah, especially because- Especially in this country, especially in this country, yeah. Well, it's important because it basically is saying that those who have occupied the stage and have presented themselves as a monolithic voice and a monolithic perspective are not that there is a diversity of opinion among the Jewish community, and particularly among younger Jews that are raising the question of, I'm not gonna allow you to do this in my name. I'm not a co-signer to oppression. I'm not gonna sign on to occupation. So there's a diversity of voices that have emerged within the Jewish community which has caused those mainline organizations that have presented themselves as the monolithic voice with great heartburn. They have great heartburn because it's not seen any longer as one voice and one ideology. We keep, uh, we keep hearing that uh, everything has changed now. At least we hope everything has changed that, you know, there is no status quo to go back to. And right now we're in the middle of this so-called humanitarian pause, whatever the hell that is. Um, but wh where do you think we go from here? Let, let's say that we have a ceasefire, but then what next? What next? Well, I think there's a cease, if there's a ceasefire, it opens the door for the discussion of where, where do we go from here? As long as you don't have a ceasefire, you got the challenge of Goliath versus David. Except this time, it's reverse. The Davids are the Palestinians, and the Goliath is Israel and the United States and all those supporters of Israel. As long as you don't have a ceasefire, you don't have a new discussion. But I think. The ceasefire opens it up to a different kind of discussion. 
a discussion that presses towards a new agenda and a new perspective. Graylin, uh, I want to give you a chance for your closing thoughts. Yeah, let me sort of preference it by saying that one of the hats I wear is with the Fellowship of Reconciliation USA. I'm their senior advisor, so I would advise people and hope that people will sign up and become a part of the Fellowship of Reconciliation as we continue to work towards these kinds of issues. Ariel, Gold, Ariel Gold is doing such good work there. And Zugby Zugby, I think, is one of the international presidents uh, as well. So good, good. Yeah, please continue, Graylin. Yep. So that's that's been important because Ariel has really added a whole lot of strength and voice and direction to the organization. It's one of the oldest pacifist organizations in the country, having been established in 1915. So join in with that. But I also want to say this, <clears throat> that we forget that nonviolent struggle has been a part of the Palestinian struggle. But their nonviolent struggle have been met with violence by Israel, with people being killed and jailed. And the problem with nonviolent resistance is you're dependent upon an audience with a conscience, an audience that's outraged over what they see happening. We've not had that audience for 75 years. Hopefully, we'll have that audience now where people will cry out with a loud voice of despair, of pain, and of anger, telling the whole world to pay attention to what is going on in Palestine and to the Palestinian people. Because we need to have voices of consciousness in order for nonviolent resistance to work. Graylin, uh, we uh, are grateful for your passion and for your prophetic voice. Um, we pray for you and send you our love that the um, immunotherapy treatment will continue to give strength to your voice. We're looking forward to welcoming you back here to Fort Wayne. 